Hey, Chris, thanks so much for joining us at the Chardian Battery Tech Virtual Conference. Um, just right off the bat, for investors that are new to the story, could you give us a brief overview of NBX and you know what you think is compelling about the company over the next year? Absolutely, and, and thanks, Brian, for having me on. I think Novonics is a really interesting story in the, in the North American landscape of battery materials and battery supply chain development. As a company, Novonics is a diversified battery materials and technology company with operations in Canada and the United States. I started the operations in Canada about 10 years ago with a focus on battery research and development and technology. And now that group has about 100 people with battery pilot lines, testing facilities to help validate all of our work on the material side of the supply chain. In 2017, we started our team in Chattanooga, Tennessee, our anode materials team to focus on synthetic graphite in the battery supply chain, a critical mineral that's controlled almost completely by China and is key to the electrification of vehicles and the energy storage sector. And over the past six years, we've built that division up to be starting mass production next year, received investments from folks like Philip 66, LG Energy Solutions, won grants with the Department of Energy, and are really poised to be one of the only companies participating locally in something that's a key part of the supply chain. And so we're really looking at that growth coming in North America for, for mid and back of this decade in the battery supply chain. Yeah, excellent. Uh, speaking of graphite and how crucial it is to the supply chain, recently prices have come down. Do you have a viewpoint on how you see that market developing over the course of the next year? Absolutely. I think pricing in battery grade graphite is a very dynamic and interesting landscape because we essentially have the market of China, where it is almost entirely where the production is and almost entirely where the consumption is, where all the battery manufacturers are today. And so we that world lives almost like a commodity with even though there are different grades of materials, there are spot prices, there are shorter term contracts. But when we look at North America, we're building a supply chain right from scratch and we're building it to service the tier ones that are coming to North America. And so we look at pricing, we look at contract structures very differently. But of course, everything does tie back to being globally competitive. And so in China, in the wave of uh, EV announcements over the past number of years, significant investment went into Chinese production. And that has put pressure this year on the price of both natural and synthetic graphite due to small oversupplies in the local market. But here in North America, we stay somewhat insulated from that because we think about long-term pricing with sustainable contracts with companies that need localized production of this material. And so, for example, our work with LG Energy Solution, I mentioned their investment. We signed a joint development agreement that's intended to lead to an initial 10-year term offtake, right? So we think about pricing and we think about contracting terms very differently here, but we have to stay rationalized to the global market, which today is in China. Yeah, very good. And how do you think that Chinese export restrictions will impact the market? And kind of how do you see those unfolding? The, the export controls placed in on graphite from China, I think, are going to add another interesting dynamic to it. I think more than anything else, it's simply putting attention on a market that we identified many years ago as seeing this problem. So. China controls over 90% of the graphite processing market for batteries in both natural or synthetic graphite. They can, of course, exert control or influence on this global market at any time, whether that is supply reductions or pricing or taxes on those exports. Now they've simply formalized the framework through these export controls through which they could do so. So in the immediate term, I don't think we'll see significant impacts. Maybe we'll see longer lead times to get materials out of China impacting production and how people look at inventory levels today. But the real risk, especially as we look at North America and emerging supply chains and, and battery manufacturing, is that in several years, if there's not enough supply, which there will be shortages in the local markets uh, for all of the US plants, and they're still reliant on China, and China chooses to implement a reduction in that export or chooses to influence the price through those exports, it's gonna have a dramatic effect in the local supply chain and something that simply will not have redundancy and something that will not have alternatives. So I think this is why you're gonna see more activity from the tier ones in shoring up and securing key partners in the graphite space to avoid this risk, not necessarily for today, but for 25, 26, 27, when so many of these plants here in the US are starting up. 
Yeah, that's right. And so as you're as you're thinking about, you know, 25, 26, 27, and even further out, do you think that the graphite market will be dominated by natural graphite or synthetic graphite? Or do you think there's room for both? How do you see that kind of market share uh, developing over that period? There's absolutely a market for both. You know, I'll start there with the simple answer because it is all about price and performance trade-offs. And it goes back to the idea that battery cells, while we talk about the commoditization of battery cells, you know, batteries, battery chemistry is still unique. It's differentiated based on the product performance. And because it is a very price sensitive market in general, we have to look at all of the trade-offs in price and performance. We don't want to over-engineer solutions. And so for that reason, for some markets, especially those with shorter cycle life requirements, you will see natural graphite have a significant role. For most of the EV-based uh, applications, synthetic graphite is the dominant choice in anode, meaning the blend ratios, if any, with natural are higher. And especially as we see more trend toward lithium iron phosphate cathodes, often those chemistries are made exclusively with synthetic graphite. And so this was when we started our anode materials division, we have deposit rights to a natural graphite deposit in Australia, which is one of the origins of the company. But we really took a position that synthetic graphite would be the higher growth uh, side of the market and a higher technology differentiation. And so we focused on new innovative technology to scale here because we think that that synthetic graphite will for this decade and beyond uh, be the key and a material to continue electrification. Yeah, and let, let's talk about government support um, a little bit because that's been a huge topic within the green energy and battery storage segment. Um, you know, most of the uh, energy storage companies that we speak with are talking about you know, what the U.S. government has done over the course of the past year to support the industry, particularly in onshoring or nearshoring supply chains. You referenced uh, expectation for future supply chain crunches. Do you think the U.S. government, North American governments are doing enough um, to, to foster uh, synthetic graphite production? I, I think the government has a critical role to play, and I think that they recognize that, and they're putting a lot of tools and frameworks in place to support um, the, the battery supply chain in general, but also targeted areas such as synthetic graphite. So the key is going to be harmonizing programs, right? There's so many opportunities, there's so many areas within the government where you can get support, whether that's capital support, whether that is trade policies, such as the Section 301 tariffs, uh, capital support, such as the infrastructure law grant that we were that we awarded $100 million through the Manufacturing Energy Supply Chains Office. Uh, we have an application with the Loan Program Office. And then on the tax side, you know, credits such as 45X and 48C, all of these things together really allow us to be competitive here in North America as we look to stand up the supply chain. But it's also critical that the government looks across all of these programs and ensures they work in harmony, right? Whether that's things from the definitional language in the critical minerals, the look on how they want to look at the foreign entity of concern language, which they gave more guidance on for comment recently. And so the government is doing a lot of the right things but they have a monumental task in front of them to try to put huge amounts of capital out the door responsibly uh, to a new and emerging supply chain where many companies such as ourselves are building mass production plant number one or number two, not number 10 or number 20, the way it's happening in Asia today. You know, speaking of that scale up where you're building production plant number one or number two compared, compared to Asia, what, what are the bottlenecks that you're seeing to scale within the North American industry? The biggest bottleneck now is capital. But of course, capital flows on the basis of many of the other fundamentals of the business being in place. And so right now, especially for something like graphite, uh, uncertainty is a big challenge in our industry, right? What will be the result of the foreign entity of concern language? What will be the impact of the export controls? People have to take a position on these things because they are not exactly defined today, but they're making an investment window that has to hold over the next five to 10 years. Because one of the challenges that we face here is capital needs to flow into these projects, high capital intensity projects. They take longer to permit and build in North America than they do in Asia. And the biggest challenge potentially is that you have to have qualified materials really to secure offtake. And so these not being commodities, offtake is a critical part of the financing package. 
And then it goes back to without uh, a plant to produce and qualify materials from, it's challenging to get offtake. And so we've really built ourselves into a very unique position where two years ago, we purchased what's our first mass production site. We call it Riverside. It's a 400,000 square foot site in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's perfect for the deployment and demonstration of our technology at scale. And we've started running mass production assets. And so we can actually provide samples of material from the development scale at our development site through to mass production scale today in order to be securing offtakes for the further financing of that plant, as well as greenfield facilities. But certainly that flow of capital and that ability to demonstrate mass production if you're building plant number one or two uh, is going to be the thing that serves as the biggest bottleneck to this industry. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and I, I'm glad that you mentioned Riverside because I want to come back to that in just a second. But as you talk about capital flowing into the industry and that being necessary for development, um, it's certainly necessary for developing new technologies. And as you're looking out on the horizon, what new technologies do you think investors should pay particular attention to in this segment? I think batteries has always been an incredibly interesting landscape on the idea of new technology, because there's almost always the promise of the next best thing, right? And we've seen this for the past 15 years that I've been in the space, right? There was always going to be the next best thing, whether it was new cathode materials, new anode materials. We took a position as a company that we don't need new technologies to make lithium ion batteries uh, prolific across vehicles and energy storage. What we actually need is better process technology. So whether it's on our anode and synthetic graphite processing or on the pilot line that we've established for our dry cathode processing in Canada, we're looking at ways to reduce the cost, reduce the environmental impact, and therefore the scalability in North America of today's key materials. And I think that that's often overlooked by investors in terms of looking for that promise of the next best thing or the next best area of growth where Today's battery chemistry looks very similar in concept to the first lithium ion batteries from the early 90s. And now it's just about scale and process scale. And so we're going to see really interesting developments in the non-lithium space, I think, in sodium, uh, in zinc, and other chemistries. But lithium ion, more than, more than we need new chemistry and new materials, we need better process and better scale. And that's really the, the task that we've set out to try to solve. Yeah, excellent. Now, just going back to Riverside, I'm, I'm happy that you mentioned that. So you're moving commercial production there. What kind of timeline can we expect um, for development of that facility? Sure. So we signed our first offtake with Core Power. They're building their Gigafactory in Buckeye, Arizona, and we'll be supporting all of their battery grade graphite needs from our Riverside site. And we're going to start production late next year in order to go through the final qualification and deliveries along as they build out their Buckeye facility. And so now we run campaign production in order to sample mass production scale, in order to collect operational data, in order to refine our engineering, not just for Riverside, but future sites. But it'll really be late 2024 that we start regular commercial production and then scale that facility to 20,000 tons uh, over the coming years really focused on that customer demand curve. And I think this is another really important element of the growth in this industry is that it needs to be customer led. Because it's not a commodity, we simply can't deploy 50,000 tons of production and sell it into a market because there's no spot market. We have to develop the right materials, qualify them with the right customers, and then bring their production online at the right time where many of these plants are being built out in North America over the coming years. And our close relationship with whether it's tier ones like Panasonic and Samsung, who we signed MOUs with in the past, or LG with their investment. This is really a critical element to how we deploy capital at the right time so that we aren't over-invested in the projects ahead of when they can start to deliver revenue. Yeah, very good. Now, you know, I think that investors familiar with the with the story certainly focus on graphite, graphite production, that that element of it. However, um, could you speak a little bit about your anode materials business and, and how you see that kind of moving over the next six months to 12 months? Do you mean the, the technology solutions group? That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. The, so absolutely, you know, critical focus of the company is on reaching that, that scaled production at Riverside next year. But we have, as I mentioned earlier, close to 100 people in our technology solutions group in Canada across two facilities where we provide equipment to the industry, which is really what the company was founded on. 
development services across the industry where we partner and support new technology development, which is why we do have a very unique lens on what those new materials, what those new chemistries may look like in the coming years. Uh, and then our cathode materials group focused on, as I mentioned, an all dry NMC cathode synthesis process that we've developed and, pat and have patents pending for. And so I think this gets a lot, gets overlooked in the story of Novonics because the scale that will come from our nanomaterials business over the next two to three years uh, dwarfs our operations in Canada. But of course, they're very strategic at the core because we want to be very technology forward and focus not just on uh, where we are today, but where those future investments can come. Because outside of China, we're at the beginning of a huge growth curve uh, in the battery space, not just in today's chemistries, but in new chemistries, as you mentioned. And so I think looking at some of the milestones from that group around, especially our cathode synthesis technology, where we've built out pilot capabilities uh, and have filed patents around that production process, really allow the opportunity for really interesting areas of growth in parallel to our anode materials group. And so I think next year is going to be a really exciting year to reach production with our anode materials group and also look at some of those commercialized commercialization milestones within our technology solutions group. Yeah, you know, and, and speaking of next year, this is the, the time of the year, December, when when investors reevaluate portfolios and develop, a, or let's say, revisit strategies for the next 12 months. So as you're thinking about 2023, what are you particularly proud of in terms of accomplishments from the company, challenges the company has faced, and, and how do you feel the company will progress through next year? What's, what's on the horizon for NBS? Sure. When, when we think about our kind of year wrap up for 2023, we really came into this year to demonstrate three things. Uh, one was our path to mass production with our new process technology uh, at our anode materials division. The second was to secure more tier one partnerships for growth in our commercial side of, of our anode materials business. And the third was to focus on financing, which, of course, as I mentioned, in the high interest rate environment has been a challenge. And without that, with that uncertainty of where interest rates will go, this is what we really need moving forward is more clarity to make to understand the investment into these growths into these growth opportunities and when we look at those three key areas of focus we announced earlier this year a few months ago that we had reached mass production scale with our graphitization furnaces hitting all of our product performance targets as well as engineering targets for those machines so this was a first in the world demonstration of continuous graphitization through induction furnaces closed loop all of the things that we held as key principles of the company when we started in 2017. We, of course, signed an investment agreement from LG Energy Solution with a JDA to lead to um, uh, intended offtake. And LG is forecasted to be the largest, if not one of the largest producers of cells here uh, in North America by 2030, right? So securing partnerships with companies like that it is critical to the long-term success of the business. And then last month, we announced that we had secured a $100 million grant for our Riverside facility. And so we really look at, in the backdrop of a very challenging macroeconomic year, the company has executed very well against our, our targets, our performance goals. And we reported you know, $87 million of cash on hand at the end of the third quarter of, last, uh, of this year. And so we still have a strong position to continue to our, invest in Riverside and meet those 2024 goals as well. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us. This has been a pleasure. Hopefully it uh, helps to shed some light on the companies for investors who are not, not quite as familiar with it. Um, so we're, we're very pleased to have had you here. Great. I appreciate it again, Brian. Thanks. Great. Thank you.